Então, vamos dar início à nossa primeira conferência magna. É, bom dia novamente. É um prazer muito grande apresentar vocês a Christian Seth. Ela é Distinguished Professor e Tyson Professor de Engenharia Química e Biológica da Universidade do Colorado, em Boulder, nos Estados Unidos. É, é interessante porque, na sua formação de engenharia, é, e que a faz aplicar conhecimentos de química na área biológica, é uma pessoa, como nós imaginamos, dar a primeira é, a conferência magna aqui. Ela é membro da Academia Nacional de Ciências dos Estados Unidos e recebeu vários prêmios e honrarias, dentre as quais, em 2020, o Prêmio Internacional da L'Oréal, Unesco, para Mulheres na Ciência, que foi quando eu a conheci e me encantei com a palestra que ela ministrou. Então, quando nós pensamos numa pessoa para falar nessa nossa reunião magna, logo me veio a ideia da Cristi. Ela é pioneira no desenvolvimento de sistemas de biomateriais para culturas de células 3D, para compreender como as células recebem e trocam informações com seu microambiente extracelular. Esse conhecimento é, então, usado para projetar materiais para aplicações, como, por exemplo, a entrega de fármacos e medicina regenerativa. Então, é sobre isso que Cristi vai falar. Christy, the floor is yours. Thank you for the kind introduction and the warm welcome. This is my first time visiting uh, Rio de Janeiro and um, inspired by the beautiful surroundings here. Um, but also the wonderful people. And I would like to tell you a little bit about some of my interests and the interest of my field, where we combine chemistry and designing new types of materials, but where all of that can occur in the presence of living systems. So one can embed cells within these material microenvironments And the goal is to coax the body to heal itself when processes go awry. Um, and so I will show a little of this in pictures. So if you look in the middle of this slide, um, so you can see a cell, but a cell is embedded in an environment, um, much like we're embedded in our surrounding environments. Um, but they receive many signals from this surrounding matrix. And this is where we're very interested in studying, is how can you use chemistry to control the signals that the cells get from that material microenvironment? And then if you look on the right-hand side, um, the idea is to coax those cells, in some instances, to regenerate tissues. So in our early work, we worked with cells that are found in cartilage. That's the surface on all of your joints that move, and it provides cushioning. And if your cartilage wears away, the currently uh, you would have an implant or a replacement, a synthetic material um, that would then serve as this new surface. But where the field is going today is taking some of your own cells and embedding them within these types of material microenvironments and coaxing cartilage to regenerate. So instead of replacing body parts, can we regenerate them and restore them so that they could be a living uh, part of you throughout your life rather than a synthetic part that could wear or have limited use? Now on the left side, sometimes, uh, we aren't as far along as being able to regenerate cartilage, and there are many complex types of tissues we'd like to repair. If you have a heart attack, part of the muscle in your heart dies, 
and we have very limited ability to regenerate that cardiac muscle. Why is that? Um, if you have diabetes, to this day, diabetics still need to take blood samples, test their blood, and inject with another drug of insulin to try to regulate their blood glucose levels. Can we do better than that? And so some of what we try to do is design little tissues that can be placed in a laboratory dish so that we can understand and begin to solve some of these more complex problems or to identify better drugs that could be useful to treat certain types of diseases where there aren't any drugs. And I will give you some examples of that. But let me first tell you a little bit about the chemistry and the materials that we use. So um, one class of materials that I'd like to teach you about today that are quite versatile for these applications are a material called a hydrogel. So that's the picture on the upper left. Um, a hydrogel is simply a material that likes water. And rather than though dissolving in water, it imbibes large amounts of water. And this makes it very useful and similar to many of the soft tissues in our bodies. So you can embed cells inside of these and they will survive and live. Now, if you could see the molecular level details of this hydrogel, what you would see would be long chains of molecules that are tied together, they interact. And this is what makes it insoluble, so it won't dissolve in water, but instead it takes up large amounts of it. Um, now I'm also trained as an engineer, someone who uses lots of technology. Um, and so as someone who uses material chemistry, I use my engineering background because once I put cells inside of these hydrogels that I make, I want to coordinate lots of events that occur on many time scales and on many different levels in space. Um, so growing a tissue requires this complex coordination. So when you cut yourself, there's a complex series of events that leads to a blood clot that can then be healed by cells infiltrating and then that goes away and our body can heal itself. What we're trying to do in tissue engineering or regenerative medicine is intervene and reset that process when healing's not occurring. Now, in these hydrogels, um, there are many different types of chemistries that one can use. So again, I'm showing you this picture of a hydrogel, and, and these are cells that we can bed in. Those are some of the cells that make cartilage. One of the chemistries that we work with, so those that are interested in the chemistry can look at the top, those that aren't can look at the bottom. Um, but one of the materials that, that we use is one called polyethylene glycol, or sometimes referred to as PEG. This is one of the most widely used synthetic materials in, in medicine. It's used to modify drugs so that they have better bio, bioavailability. It's used in some of the vaccine delivery systems that we heard about some this morning. My group uses these PEGs because we put reactive molecules on the ends of these. And the key to this is that all the reactions we develop can happen in tissues, in cells, and in the body. And when they react, they link together all of these chains, and that's what makes the hydrogel. Now, the thing about this, though, is that pegs are synthetic materials, and um, our body and the cells in our body don't recognize peg. This is what makes it a wonderful biomacromolecule because water goes all around that chemistry and they move around um, and so it makes it very compatible and uh, inert from a perspective of putting this in the body. There's not a large immune response or inflammation. So this is very good for cells like on the top. Cells in your cartilage are naturally round and spherical and they like this inert environment and they secrete and make cartilage tissue. On the bottom, these are cells found in your pancreas that make insulin and respond to glucose. 
they form lots of cell-cell aggregates, and that's really important, these large spheres for their signaling. But in many cases, cells get information from this surrounding. Um, and I don't think this movie will play, but these two cells here happen to be stem cells from your bone marrow that help bones heal. And um, they like to attach to the matrix and move around. And then this little video, you'd see they'd stay rounded and they wouldn't move. And because of that, they'll undergo a programmed cell death called anoecus um, because they need matrix signals. So many times we like synthetic materials, but we need to modify them with biological cues. And so um, this is the way my group thinks about these types of questions, is how do we go from a cell in a matrix that's embedded and it can take on any shape or take on different types of mechanical properties from the tissue we like, but how can we begin to integrate biological cues that are found in the body? And so we want to change it from this simple synthetic system to something on the bottom that a cell can make a protease or an enzyme that it can degrade and the material will break down and degrade. That the cell and all the receptors on its surface can bind within the matrix and get signals to survive or to divide and proliferate. It's also a reservoir for many different types of factors, growth factors, things that tell the cells where to move or stimulate them to make lots of tissue. Uh, so we also like to design these to have different bindings groups. Um, and we design two different types of systems depending on those applications. On the right-hand side, sometimes we'll call a cell dictated. We want to make it much like the matrices in our body, and the cells decide how to degrade, to degrade it, when to degrade it, what types of signals. So we're trying to mimic those processes that occur in vivo. And then on the second, I'm going to give you an example where sometimes we like to put these types of cell-laden hydrogels under a microscope, and we want to be able to trigger a change um, and to, for the user to be able to manipulate the cell's environment. And then we can watch how the cell responds. And in that way, we learn something about the basics of what signals are required for cells to take on certain functions. Um, and so I'll go through an example of that in the second half of this talk. So um, here, one of the ways that we began to functionalize these molecules and the way that we think about it in going from purely synthetic to synthetic and biologic is we take advantage of a series of reactions in chemistry that are called click reactions. Um, so the Nobel Prize in chemistry was given to the individuals that discovered this and developed this concept of click chemistries, where really all it is is it's two different N groups that come together and react in a way with high efficiency, even in a complex milieu. In biology and in the body, we always have a complex milieu of other types of molecules. But these click reactions occur with very high efficiency and find one another in that environment. Um, and so this is very desirable. And it's used for many, many applications, but one of the Nobel laureates, Carolyn Bertozzi, received the prize because of her contributions of being able to do this in biological systems. Um, so the idea is, can I make different types of two components, a synthetic material with one reactive group, a biologic material with the complementary reactive group? And in my own research, we've uh, developed this bottom one here which is based on a thiol reacting with an ene. Um, the important part of this, though, is my group specializes in using light to make materials and modify them. And that's particularly beneficial in biology because when you use light to make materials, you can control on demand. They'll only react when you expose to light. And that's also very compatible because it can be done under physiological conditions at the, the body's temperature and at the body's pH. Um, and so you'll see a little bit of a theme in some of these photo reactions that we use. So we're going to make uh, networks out of this. And um, one more little bit part about the chemistry is so it's this style ene reaction. So on the bottom, we take our favorite PEG molecules and we're putting this on that has this funny structure of a ring. 
And that makes it very, very reactive to the thiol that's up above. And our thiol of choice is cysteine. It's an amino acid found in proteins. And so we use a lot of solid phase peptide synthesis where you take a small bead and you can synthesize amino acids, small sequences found in different proteins. Um, and that was chemistry developed at the University of Col Colorado. Marv Carruthers developed all of that chemistry um, as well as all of the chemistry for making nucleic acid chains. So it's nice to have a local expert in making these peptides. Um, so we click together these to introduce a biologic part and a synthetic part, and then um, in today's modern age, to figure out which ones to include, the laboratory can now take advantage of liquid handling systems, little robot arms, that can mix together these two different components and put them into wells, arrays of like 96 wells or hundreds of wells, and make all of these hydrogels and embed cells within them. And then we load this up on a microscope, and the microscope is high throughput and will automatically image all of these. So you can begin to think for imaging of properties that you might like to have. If I'm working with a stem cell and I want it to differentiate to form a bone cell, or if I'm trying to expand and grow cells and have them proliferate in, in large amounts. Um, so I don't think my controller will allow me to play the movies, but um, so here's just one example where I take this PEG molecule with my ring-strained ene, and these are just some of the peptides that we spell out and make. And this happens to have one peptide that has in blue this RGD letters. That's one that the cells can bind to, and it gives a survival cue. And then uh, the one on the bottom is one that cells can make proteases, enzymes that can degrade, and they'll break this down. So on the top, all the small dots are cells. And if this movie were playing, you would see these cells. They would migrate all around this matrix. And then on the bottom, if I misspell it, if I misspell the degradation sequence and I change the W to an A, all of a sudden the cells can still bind and survive in this, but they can't move. So now you can start thinking about making biomaterials that you can put in the body that certain cells can migrate and infiltrate, but others cannot. And so that's one of the very first studies that we did. Is that we looked at a bone defect, a large bone defect. So sometimes when you have, are in a car crash and you have large amounts of bone that's lost, or particularly if it's bone uh, that's in your cranium, your cranial and face area, because your cranium protects your brain. So even though bones can heal themselves in certain areas, you need the bone to heal very quickly for its a protective effect. And so here is a large defect in the skull of a, of a rat that will not heal on its own. But if we put in our hydrogels that the bone marrow stem cells can infiltrate and regenerate, in the middle is the one that had that A misspelling variant that the cells couldn't infiltrate very much. And you get some bone that forms around the edges. You can see the white infiltrating. And then on the far right, if we have the ones that the cells can migrate all through, we see large amounts of regeneration across this bone that wouldn't otherwise occur. So this is quite striking. Putting a material in place can allow bone to heal that wouldn't happen. Now, on the bottom, you can see that this still takes several, several weeks for, to heal. And if you look at it carefully, you can see that it isn't healed quite all the way. So this is where we began to think as basic scientists and, and trying to go back from the bedside to treating patients to the bench to how do we make things work better. And we asked questions. How simple is complex enough in making a material? I can introduce all kinds of complexity, but then that makes it maybe harder um, to treat a patient that has a very large bone loss 
or a young patient, or an older patient, or if it's in a bone area that doesn't, it heals very slowly, or one that heals quickly. So we're constantly faced with this. How do we make something simple enough that could be a product that could help patients, versus how do we introduce complexity in ways that we know things uh, can work better? So these are just some of the questions we ask. Those hydrogels that I showed you introduce biological functionality, but our tissues they're assembled into hierarchical structures that have all kinds of fiber shapes or different types of align, alignment. Um, in coordinating bone healing, there's a whole cascade of these growth factors that occur, some early and some late. Should I do that and incorporate that into my matrices to make it heal faster? We were relying on the endogenous. That's the cells that are already in the tissue to come in and migrate. Maybe if I need this to happen faster, I need to deliver some of the patient's cells to stimulate this, and which cells should I deliver? And, and I think the field is also very interested in how can we personalize these types of products so there's not just one off-the-shelf product for everyone, but perhaps we can begin to take into account some of the differences between people and, and between their injuries and treating them. So um, I'm just going to show you one example, one way we think about this and are going. So how could you make this diverse? Well, one way to do this is rather than just making one hydrogel that fits into the, the defect and regenerates the tissue of the shape you're trying to do, we have all kinds of ways that I can make small microparticles or nanoparticles of these same types of materials. And then I can mix them together in all different types of combinations. And clicking them together and forming sort of these granular self-assembled systems. Um, I think this picture might show it a little better. You could envision having off the shelf different particles that you could mix and match. Some might degrade fast and some might degrade slowly. Some might have a biologic that would stimulate the cells to move faster. Some might have others that would tell them to mineralize and differentiate and form bone cells faster. Um, they could be mixed together in all different types of, of combinations. And then cells can be embedded in them. So these pictures on the left show some of these bone marrow cells that can be taken from an aspirate in the bone marrow of the patient. Um, these bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cells are some of the most widely used stem cells in, in medicine. They're used for all kinds of therapeutic effects because they secrete lots of factors. Um, they're used not just in our bone, but they're delivered to our hearts to try to help the muscle repair after a heart attack. It's being tested in clinical trials. It's being used and delivered to try to help with neurodegenerative diseases and some of the factors that can help reduce inflammation in the brain. So that's the idea. Um, this next slide, I, I won't, don't want to go through the details here, but this is the idea, is that once you put these bone marrow cells, we can use all kinds of different omic technology to look at what the cells are secreting. And we can tune our particles and what's in them to cause and help the cells survive. That's on the far bottom right. But we can also tailor the factors that they secrete and make them secrete things that are anti-inflammatory or make them secrete things that make bone faster. Um, so these are the types of things that we learn and collaborate uh, and also have bioengineers and biologists working on this. And then the idea is we can take these types of mixtures, we can put cells within them, design so that they secrete different factors, and then they're printable. So we can use all kinds of advanced biomanufacturing tools to inject these types of systems. And now we can begin to heal even more complex defects. Rather than the thin bone over our cranium, we can begin to look at large defects that occur uh, from large fractures or perhaps a, a bone cancer and osteosarcoma. Um, so, so this is where some of our field is going, introducing complexity. But now let me take a, a step back 
And those were all trying to make materials that could mimic what happens in our body and the, and the matrix environments that stimulate cells and cause healing. Now I want to talk a little bit on this left side. When might we want to design systems that I can watch in a dish and control and direct cells? So I want to tell you a little bit about an area that's emerging in my field and across many fields. And this is an area where you take a small stem cell. It can be an adult stem cell from a tissue in your body, or it can be an induced pluripotent stem cell. And biologists have found ways that you can take that single stem cell and it will grow and proliferate. And then they switch the factors that are in the media in the dish and they'll start to spontaneously differentiate. And they're called organoids because they capture all the different diverse cell types that are found from the tissue from which the stem cell arose. So you'll see papers on the kidney organoid. From a kidney stem cell, they'll differentiate and form all the cells found in your kidneys. The brain organoid, differentiate and forming a miniaturized version of a region within your brain with all the diverse phenotypes. I'm going to tell you about the intestinal organoid, where we can take a biopsy from intestines or the colon and, and regrow the intestinal epithelium. And I'll tell you why that's an interesting and important area. Now, um, so I told you a little bit about that, but why do we want to do this? So it's really hard to take different types of cells and grow them together. So if I wanted to make a muscle, I would take muscle cells and I'd take nerve cells and I'd try to get them to innervate maybe along with some blood vessel forming cells. And if I took all those cells as an engineer, it's hard to get them to coordinate and grow them all at the same time and at the right rate and get them to integrate. But if I use a single stem cell and let it, and it let itself assemble, all of a sudden I can have multiple cell types that function a lot like the organoid and it can be really useful for things like screening for adverse side effects of drugs. Screening for drugs that could treat a cancer, but it would be very specific to the patient whose cell that you derive the organoid from. Um, from the intestinal organoid, lots of drugs get absorbed across the intestine. So how can you design better drug delivery systems to make things orally available? Insulin cannot be delivered orally, it has to be a shot. Maybe there'd be ways that we could screen for and develop ways to do that. And then it's also a source of transplantable tissue. So could we have miniaturized versions of organoids that might have a certain function that could be transplanted in individuals um, that could serve the, the benefits of uh, eliminating some of the shortage of organs for transplant. Now, um, here, I just want to tell you a tiny bit of background so you can understand some of the images that I'm going to show you. So in your intestine, it's, it's a tube um, that processes and absorbs food, and we get nutrients, and it filters out things. Um, but it's an amazing dynamic tissue. And if you could see the details of it, it's not just a flat tube. It undulates. It goes up and down. And it's super dynamic. In the bottom part of these undulations is a little crypt, and that's where all your stem cells reside. And those crypt cells migrate up, and they regrow all the cells that are the surface of your intestines, which help you keep infections out and help nutrients cross. And it's super dynamic. It does this every five to six days. It regrows the whole lining of your intestine. So it's a really interesting model to look at. Um, so I'm going to tell you about the stem cells in the bottom. Some of the slides will say ISC. That just means it's an intestinal stem cell. And it was discovered uh, about almost 10 years ago because there's a receptor on it. It's called LGR5. And that allowed us to be able to isolate these from patient biopsies and grow intestinal organoids. So the, the model is this. I take an, a patient's stem cell, and I grow it, and it forms 
this cyst, this tube-like structure. And then when I differentiate it, uh, the red and green, uh, those are the crypts. That's where the stem cells go. Now, in the bottom image, if you can see this very well, those are some of the first intestinal organoids that were grown. And it was a great discovery, and it was very interesting. But if you look closely, all the stem cells are labeled so that they fluoresce green. And so that's where all those crypts are. And hopefully someone who's maybe not even trained or seeing this for the first time, you can see that these crypts are all different sizes. They're spaced differently. Um, and every single intestinal organoid that you grow looks a little different. And so the question came to us when we began our work in this field is if we want to use these for drug screening or to understand diseases like cancer, do we need to have organoids that are more similar in size and shape? Because in biology and in uh, human medicine, a lot of times function follows the form. So how important is that? And so this is where some of our material chemistry came into play. So we got interested in taking some of our peg, favorite PEG molecules, and we're going to put reactive end groups on this. Um, and in this case, we're going to use another one of the click reactions. Here it just happens to be an alkyne and an azide. That was one of the first click reactions discovered. Um, and then we're going to put our peptides in, but rather than using the thiol of cysteine, we can put azides onto this. So we're going to make hydrogel, so we mix these together. On the bottom is just a trace that we can watch how this reaction occurs. Uh, and it occurs, and it takes about five to 10 minutes to make these gels. And there's a picture of one of those intestinal stem cells that we can grow inside of these hydrogels. So we can use the same conditions that was known in the field to grow them and to differentiate them. But here's the special part of the experiment. The special part is that we put a linker inside of this hydrogel. This linker absorbs light from a laser. It's a nitrobenzyl ether group. And when it absorbs light from a laser, and in particular a laser on a confocal microscope that we use for imaging, it degrades, it cleaves the hydrogel. And so here's the experiment. We grow from these intestinal stem cells. We grow them into these cyst structures that are going to form the tubes of your intestine. And now when we differentiate it, we come in with a 405 colored laser from our microscope, and we pattern, we degrade in regions. We soften the hydrogel where we want the crypts to grow. So we're going to direct where symmetry breaking occurs. So using materials to guide differentiation. And that's what happens. So when we differentiate, the cells begin to grow into these softened regions, and they completely fill them. We can control the number, the size, the shape. And using lasers, these are really fast reactions. It takes 16 microseconds per pixel dwell time. So what does that mean? That's about, it's faster than you'd normally image, or it's about the same you would image a cell on a microscope. And so we can make a whole bunch of these, and about you know, 80 to 90% of them form exactly the structures we want to have. So we're really excited about this, making things reproducibly and using them as, as a screening tool and better understanding. Um, and I just showed you a picture of the cells, but you don't know which cells are sorting, and are they sorting in the right way? So we can also label these and have the green fluorescent stem cells and we can show those are the ones that go to the crypts. They self-sort. So I won't tell you about this, but they actually sense mechanically their environment, and that controls inside information, what's going on in the nucleus, um, and how the cells respond and differentiate and sort. Um, and so we can also show the crypt cells, labeling them red, that those are the proliferating ones. Those are the ones that are going to move up and, and regenerate and regrow the whole lining of your intestine. So that all looks great. Um, we can make these in different ways. So we can make them with three crypts or two crypts, two crypts that are orthogonal. 
We can watch how the crypts naturally turn over and regenerate themselves. But what I want to maybe tell you about is, so this is all very exciting and advancing. Um, and I love images, because I feel like I learn so much from watching how cells respond to changes in their environment. But one thing we don't tell you about is that when you try to image things that are the size of tissues or these organoids, it gets hard. That light doesn't penetrate as far and deeply into this. And you have to play all kinds of different types of tricks and use advanced imaging, imaging from the top and imaging from the bottom, using more uh, microscopes that are now available, or maybe $10 million microscopes to get high resolution images or light sheets. Um, so what I want to tell you about, though, is so we got interested, and in this final vignette, of how can we better see these organoids? And finding a clever way that you could use not more expensive microscopes that are still hard to do in three dimensions, but instead use materials to do this. So my question here is the seeing believing. Uh, so how do we understand things in complex 3D environments and be able to track things in time? So we were inspired by some of the work of Ed Boyden, who um, was studying how nerves attach to one another and signal to one another. And he had developed a technique where normally you'd grow these neurons or cells on a flat surface. And then we, there are techniques for staining them. You take an antibody that will stain for something you want to look at, a protein of interest. And then you use a second antibody that has a fluorophore on it. And that's what you image. So these antibodies give you specificity to the things you want to look at. And the fluorophore helps you image where those molecules are that are bound. So what Ed did was he said, well, I want higher resolution. I want to see things in more detail. I want to know how memories form and synapses or signaling happen. So really small details. And what he realized was that in materials field, we have something called uh, super absorbent materials, molecules that imbibe large amounts of water and super swell. And the reason they do that is they have charge on them. So they're not neutral, and the charges want to repel one another. And so as you begin to ionize the hydrogel and make more and more charges, it imbibes more and more water. So this is what's used in super absorbent diapers. It's also used in soils to help with water retention. Um, and so Ed was using these to make materials that when he did the second antibody, he had the precursors to these super swellable materials that could react with the secondary antibody. And then he would change the pH of the solution, and it would swell. And when it swells, it expands your sample, so you can still image the same volume, but now all of a sudden it's higher resolution because you've expanded your whole cell. And so we got very interested and collaborated with Ed because we had some chemistries that we thought could be quite nice that we could expand things and expand more than 100 times in volume, that expand them uniformly because you don't want it to distort what you're looking at. It has to expand the same in all of space. Um, we also thought, well, we wanted to do this in a couple steps. We wanted to do complex 3D tissues, not cells on a, on a dish. And if you did this, could you say, I zoomed in once? And then this was really interesting. Could I zoom in again? Much like you do with a microscope with objectives, but can you use materials to do that? And so um, I'm not going to go through the chemistry here because of time. But the idea that I've maybe alluded to some is we can grow our organoids inside of hydrogels. And hydrogels that can be degraded by light or in the case of the bone marrow cells that could be degraded by enzymes that could be added. And so once you grow them, then when you do the staining, you make another hydrogel inside of that three-dimensional complex. You degrade away the first hydrogel, and then you expand it. Um, 
and can begin, so here's just an example. So here's some of the controls. This is a molecule found inside of a cell. It's a tube called beta tubulin, and we know lots about it from electron microscopy and high resolution imaging. Here's what happens if you stain for beta tubulin on the left, just in using a regular technique in our hydrogels. And then on the right, um, this is what happens when you expand it. Now, if you can see the high resolution details you can get of these tubes, but we can analyze it and show that we can go to about 50 nanometers in resolution with standard optical microscopes. So we can get really high resolution features. And then this is something that we use to test that it's isotropic. Because if we got defects and measured things that weren't correct for beta tubulin, we'd know our material formulation had to be optimized. Um, so these are some of the things that we've done with our organoids. So you can super expand. And you can leave on the right the nucleus intact, so you can look at the nucleus at the same time. You can look at that GFP that the stem cells are secreting. And you can also leave behind things that are found in the cell membrane. Um, and importantly, uh, I don't know if I can, usually these play on click. Um, so here, that's an expansion microscope image. We're going from top to bottom. And hopefully you can see the high resolution that we get. On the left, it didn't play, but you get lots of attenuation. On the right, this is the quantification of those images. So up on the top um, is the expanded sample. And so we can go hundreds of microns. I'm only showing 40 to 50, and we get penetration of light, and we can image throughout. But if I don't expand it, if I only go 40 microns in, already more than half of my light's attenuated. So I, I can't image as well. Um, okay, it's not just organoids. These are single cells. And you can see in a single cell the processes and how they interact with the material and are degrading it. You can look at the molecules and how they form mature interactions and focal adhesions. So this gets at the question is how do cells get information from outside all the way to inside? And so we can also look at um, the nucleus itself high resolutions of the image of the nucleus and how the nucleus begins to remodel its structure and chromatin which changes the genes the cells express. Um, so this is all recently uh, work that's now in press that should come out in the next week or two. So those of you who are interested, some of our work with these uh, photo expansion microscopy images. All right, so I wanna make sure to leave time for questions. So, you know, I'll maybe leave you with some things to think about. You know, are, are what we learn from the bench good predictors of in vivo outcomes? How will this translate to impacting human health? Um, are things that we do in trying to precisely engineer whether it's cells or delivery of molecules, um, is that hype or hope? Are we still left with just having off-the-shelf materials to treat people, or can we begin to think about personalizing? We're already personalizing and using patients' own cells to treat the disease, including things like CAR T cell therapies uh, for treating cancer. But modifying cells in that treatment costs about a half, 500,000 US dollars per patient. It's prohibitively expensive. So how much can we personalize for one individual versus can we begin to think about, well, certain patients have certain markers of a disease or they've injured this particular bone or they have cartilage with degeneration with this type of inflammation. Here's how I should design a product for this class of people. Um, so maybe it's not going to be a personalized product for each individual, but maybe for some subsets of people. And um, I'll leave you with one comment that in the field of drug delivery, and some, a lot of times it's dosed based upon the mass of an individual. And a woman is not a small man when you measure mass. So that is what I thought I'll leave you with, and then I'm gonna just put up my acknowledgements and I'll be happy to answer questions. So all of this was the work of a great group of collaborators who I've had highlighted throughout. 
Um, my group half works on new types of materials, the other half works on the biological problems, and it's an all a multidisciplinary effort. And I didn't conduct a single experiment. Um, it was all their efforts um, that I had the pleasure of guiding them through. And uh, those are the individuals in my, my group as of May, and um, I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Hello, hello. Oh, yes. Uh, wonderful talk, Chrissy. Very inspiring. Uh, see the connections between chemistry, tissue engineering, and outcomes. So my question is, uh, your, your organoids, of course, the intestine uh, has to have uh, several different functions, like absorbing water, uh, delivering, or, or allowing different things to go through those tissues. Uh, can you uh, uh, do experiments to see if your organoids can show some of the properties that a native kind of tissue would, would have? Thanks for that, that question. Um, yes, and those are uh, where we're going. Now that we can make organoids of uniform structures, we're testing things like do they form tight junctions similar to what's in your, epi your intestinal epithelium? And testing, does it have the right barrier properties? Can um, certain drugs be absorbed? And what, what influences their absorption rate? Um, we're probably farthest along where um, lots of patients have biopsies of their colon, especially once you're over 50 years of age, to test for cancers. So what we're doing is we're growing uh, intestinal organoids from patients that had either different variants of, ca of cancer and we know which drugs they responded to or didn't. And so we're using that as a proof of principle. Do we see something similar with what we grow in a dish to what's observed? So it's still at a validation stage and not as predictive yet. Hi, it was a very nice story. I, I was wondering when you mentioned that when you use stem cells and differentiate them, that you would get all the cells from the tissue. But when we think about a cells from the immune system that they are actually present in all tissues, let's say tissue macrophages. So depending on the tissue, tissue macrophages would come from different sources. And would you seed a differentiated macrophages in your organoids, or you, you really think that the, the stem cells would generate all cells, including macrophages, and of course, lymphocytes would not be possible to come from these cells, so. Right. I think the question is a very good one. Um, right now, the field is at um, more of a simplified mimic of the cells that are there, and when adult cells are used, um, like within the intestine, you just get the intestinal epithelial cells. When you use um, induced pluripotent stem cells for the intestine, you get the epithelial cells and the surrounding mesenchyme, all the fibroblasts that lead to different fibrotic diseases, but still not the immune cells. So I think the field will eventually have to go there. Um, and so I think right now, most of what's done is just using conditioned media from different types of macrophages and not introducing them into the culture yet. But um, it's a great area for rich exploration that is better complexity depending on the question. If you want to look at inflammatory type of intestinal diseases, it'll be critical. English or Portuguese? Uh, English. English, okay. Okay. <laughs> then I can hear. Thank you very much for your talk. I was uh, very much interested in your last slide about the fact that uh, 
women are not small men. Uh, men men have been, has been used as the model uh, in science many times. Even our genitalia was, uh, a, a number of centuries ago, was uh, interpreted as an inverse version of, uh, of the male penis. So I would like to know how, how this impacts still, or if not, if not on, the, on the medicines that uh, we have available. Yeah, I think that's a, a great question. Um, at least uh, in one subset, there's um, a great interest in trying to use human heart or cardiac tissue in a dish to screen for drugs. So one of the, the heart is one of the, has one of the most detrimental effects on drugs that are used, and it's hard to predict what would happen. So there are dramatic cases of drugs that were approved that affected women differently than men and had to be recalled. So one way is people are designing from IPS cells cardiac myocyte tissue, and they're beginning to require that as a screen for drugs. Um, in my example, uh, people that are over 65 years of age, about 10% of the people develop heart valve disease. In men, it tends to cause calcification of their tissue. And in women, it leads to more of a scar, a real thickening, and less calcification. Right now, there are no drugs to slow or stop heart valve disease. Instead, they just replace it. So I think, especially if we ever want to have a hope of having a drug to treat heart valve disease and fibrosis, we're going to have to look at men and women differently. Um. May I? Yeah, well, thank you so much for your fantastic talk. And I have two uh, brief questions. The first one, uh, these last two models that you showed us, how far are you for putting this from bench to practice? Do you have any uh, time uh, uh, period for when we're going to have this really going on into medical practice? As and your last slide, uh, have you tested in these models if you have the the, the cells from a woman and then from a man and tested according to the hormonal uh, effect because we know hormones really do impact different cells. If you have any data on that. And thank you so much. It's really exciting. I'll talk to you later on on some other questions. All right. So... Um in the field, I think the most advances that have gone into products and treatments are tissues that have more of a structural, um, so a structural function. So we can replace skin for patients that have diabetic wounds or burns. It, it's not innervated. It's not vascularized. Uh, cartilage is now something that we can repair. Bones we can get to heal faster. Vascular grafts uh, are now being used uh, for bypass surgeries or stents. Um, I think the more complex tissues, we are not close to having things that are transplantable. I think where we're getting better is um, with the mission to try to reduce animal studies, that we have good models that can be used in vitro for, for screening. So those are some of the advances, so smaller. But we're still... Somebody can have the smallest nick in their spinal cord, you know, less than a millimeter, hundreds of microns, and we can't get that to repair and regenerate and people are paralyzed. So how can we do that? That's a, so that's something that, that we need. Um, and then, yes, there are many different differences between men and women, and some are hormonal fluctuations. Um, women also have uh, in all mammals, almost all mammals, have a stronger inflammatory response. Um, and so I would say that we don't recapitulate all of that in vitro, in particular like with the heart valve disease. That occurs over decades. So that's another challenge. How can we study something in vitro and try to accelerate and learn something about the treatment so we can get old pa patients from 
cells from older patients, and we're beginning to understand that. But the time course of things that occur over decades and monthly or even um, different types of nocturnal effects and sleeping habits, uh, so that's something that we still need to study and understand. Thank you. Thank you, Christy, for your wonderful talk, very exciting talk. And I think it's a fantastic example of very basic chemistry, if I may say so, click chemistry, going into um, helping uh, to model biology and understand biology. Thanks a lot.